than some people who are um, at medical school. Uh, so I'm going to try and um, therefore speak to um, an age range of a few years. It's quite a big gap of a few years because obviously some people are doing A levels and some are actually uh, not too far from being doctors. Um, and the topic I've been asked to speak about is, um, I suppose, to, to look at academic uh, medicine and academic medical career, and, and I'm going to sort of base that around obviously what I've done and uh, try and broaden that out a bit. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has a lot of detail and opinion, but I don't want people to really focus on the details. I want to get a general flavour of some of the points that I'm trying to make. So some of the slides do have quite a bit of information on them, um, but uh, the, the idea really is to try and understand on each slide will, um, you know, the point that I'm trying to make. So and I'm also not going to talk for an hour, I don't know, I'll probably talk about um, half an hour, 35 minutes, and there'll be time for questions uh, afterwards. Um, so, uh, oh, it is going on, so it's fine. Okay. Um, so I'm going to briefly just talk about um, my um, career so far. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about speciality training, uh, not very much. Uh, a little bit about academic training, and uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the science that I've done in the context of those three uh, initial um, topics. Um, so looking at how the, the work I've done fits into my, my career and, and how I've had to look at the way um, both the clinical training and the academic um, training uh, has to accommodate that. And then I'm just going to make a few concluding remarks. Um, so, so it's a bit, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a dance, right? So, yeah, so I went to a university in 92. Uh, so I'm uh, 50 next year. So uh, time uh, flies somewhat. Um, so it's interesting, we've just had, I, I sat in on the session that Natasha did about applying to a uh, university. It was very different then. So when I applied, uh, we did have UCAS. Um, we didn't have personal state, I think. I don't know, maybe we did. I, I don't know. I don't recall right on. Um, I, I went on a school trip in the summer and met my one interviewer, um, and we got to know each other um, a little bit. Um, I went back for the interview uh, around Christmas, and the interview was simply how's the family? Yeah, fine. How was Italy for the holiday? Yeah, fine. How's the art going? Yeah, great. See you next year then. Uh, that was the extent of it. So I think things have changed a little bit um, since then, but um, it, it, anyway, it worked for me. And um, so I went to Morgan in Cambridge and I did my undergraduate degree there and um, did relatively well there. Most of us who went to Cambridge left halfway through after three years um, and went to um, London or some to Oxford, although some did stay on which is a strange historical quirk of, of Cambridge and the medical school there. They have more undergrads than um, they have clinical places, or we're used to. Um, so I went to the second half of my degree in London, uh, we're all free, um, and got my um, medical degree there. Um, and then I did about six years or so of medical jobs. So we called my house officer and senior house officer. Uh, which were the first years of our training and then being a clinical fellow. And in those days, the medical structure of those years was, was a lot less, it, it started to become a bit more standardised and regulated. Um, certainly only the house officer year, and then you tend to do at least two years of senior house officer, but it was then a bit vague as to what happened to get to the specialist level. And um, they, they were starting to regulate that because some people were, were spending literally about a decade in these sort of jobs floating around and they started to bring in a notion of jobs being recognised for training or not but this was all happening around there so it was quite a vague sort of fluid time a lot of people went to, to Australia for a year and things like that as well so it was, it was all quite sort of fluid and so I spent maybe a little bit longer um, than some people um, in getting to a uh, specialist level uh, but I did um, uh, surgery uh, for a few years so I got my uh, MRCS uh, I didn't ever want to be a surgeon, but you sort of had to do either medicine or surgery in those days before you did um, other specialities, so I did some of that. Uh, and then I joined the Manchester Radiology Training Scheme, um, and that was in 2004. Um, and that's when I then had a bit of a different career plan for most people. So um, just to give a bit of an idea on the schematic there, I started like a sort of normal person in September 2004. 
And then I only did a year of uh, what we called SPR, so it's like ST uh, nowadays. Um, and then, and during that time, I then um, arranged for me from Cancer Research UK, and I started a PhD after a year. So I had what's called out of program experience, and we had three years. Uh, went through which time I did my PhD, and um, then I went back into training, but I went in as a year three, so I never did second year. Uh, but during my PhD, I did all my professional exams, uh, which shows you don't really need to actually do medicine to actually pass all these exams, you need time to, to basically study. Uh, for it. So I then um, went back in and did my final year of training, which I uh, and on that last year and a half or so, I had a lecture post, I was doing 50 50. Uh, do more research again post PhD and still finishing. So I finished in 2012 in January. So I was um, nearly 38 when I finished. So it's a long time of training. So it was 20 years from going to university to, to finishing. But I had done a PhD and I did all that training. And I say the, the phase. Uh, does that come? Yeah, so, so this um, phase here is now a lot shorter for lots of people. So a lot of people now, when they qualify as consultants, are more like about 31, 32, uh, unless of course you've done research or if you have time out from, say, maternity leave or other factors. Um, so, um, you know, you are potentially uh, quite old sometimes when you get to the end of this, uh, this stage. Of course, you know, it's topical in the news about junior doctors and junior doctor strikes um, at the moment. And you know, you're still a junior doctor up to that point there. So until the day you become a consultant, you're a junior doctor. Um, so, I, so I had quite a long uh, period of training, but did a lot of research during that, that time. And then from 2012 to, to, to now, still, um, I went up from senior lecturer, read and a bit of a professor about six years, I think. Um, and I do a day a week at the Christie. So up until three years ago, I was doing, um, I was getting paid five days, for research one day for clinicals of like a 12 session, six day contract. And um, that was my job. And I had a research group in the university here. And I was doing uh, basically five hours of NHS work um, a week plus some what we call SBA time, which is like supporting professional activity time. <coughs> so, so that was my type of job. Um, and then three years ago, I uh, was basically um, recruited by the ICR in London, which is um, a, a big cancer. Uh, research Institute, and um, so I took a job there, but I retained my Manchester job. So I still have, I still do my clinical work at Christie. I have one day at the university, but I, I main work in London. So I have a research group in Manchester, and I have a research group in London as well. Um, and I basically work for two competitors, which is a bit of an odd arrangement, which I'm not sure I'd recommend actually, but it sort of works just about. Um, so I do quite. Uh, oh right, yes, uh, this. So this slide's in the wrong place. I don't know, let me put that in late. So I'll go back to that there. Um, so um, I've got a very odd medical career because I do academia and I do very, very little clinical work and I work in London and Manchester. So I've got quite an odd career. Um, I found this yesterday. I quite, quite like this, actually. You can read this. So, so bear in mind that about um, half the people um, who qualify and practice in the UK as doctors or GPs, and about half are um, specialists. Right. So I would say that one of the key things um, when you're thinking of careers, um, so obviously this is more personal to people who are at medical school at the moment, but I think for yourselves still, it's, if you're at um, you know, school or college, it's still relevant, is do you want to be a generalist or a specialist? Right. So that's quite a for me, that's probably the first question if you're trying to work out what sort of career you want. Um, so a generalist, we're generally talking about general practice, and a specialist, we're generally talking about hospital, but it's probably not quite as hard and fast as that. But are you someone who, for example, as a typical example of a GP, a family doctor, you don't know what's coming in next, you could get you know, a body charge, you could get um, an exposure with mental health, and you could get someone who's uh, into their leg, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. In reality, you tend to get a lot of people with mental health problems, a lot of sniffy children, you know, ear aches, et cetera, uh, people who need asthma reviews, et cetera. So you don't tend to get many aneurysms that are about to burst, but you need to also be able to spot that. So, but that's quite a generalised 
um, a general job with lots of um, uh, skills that are necessary for that. We don't have to have massive in-depth knowledge on many things, but you need to know how to appropriately handle things like being you know, short of breath, headaches, etc., and all the common conditions that you're going to see as a GP. And you need to know, you know how to refer people on. So that's, that's one type of job and tends to be done in the community and practices. Obviously, there's lots of key elements that are important for that, such as can you manage a business, etc. cetera. You know, that's, that's, that's critical for being a GP, nothing to do with medicine. Um, and, um, and again, actually, I think maybe for the people who, who are coming up for interviews, um, very few people actually tend to mention that. And yes, of course, at Manchester, I think more than half the people who um, finish become GPs. So I think, you know, if you've, for example, done economics as a A-level, that's actually probably quite um, a good thing. And it, it certainly, I think if you were to have an interview and your person say, say, you know, I've done economics, you know, I'm, I'm interested in medicine, um, you know, I think I want to be a doctor, but I'm, I'm you know, aware that a lot of people nowadays are effectively running businesses if they're a general practitioner. I quite like the note. I think the note I might want to be a GD because I like interacting with people. I think I find that variety stimulating. I think that would actually look quite impressive. I think, that, I think you'd probably stand out from the crowd if you something like that. But I think, I think you know, that's, that's one type of job. And then specialist is, you know, as, as the name implies, it's where you tend to do a narrow type of thing. So you're an ENT surgeon or you're a psychiatrist or you're a pediatrician, et cetera. And this cartoon is obviously um, um, just um, being a little bit flippant. But so, so for example, you know, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're sane and you, um, you know, you, you're relatively hardworking, you know, what should you do? Well, it depends on the patient preference of the patient's so asleep, you like anesthesia, if the patient's dead, you like pathology, if the patient's paralyzed, you might do neuro. I mean, obviously, that's, that's not um, absolutely it's not, but, but there is a certain truth in that. Surgeons tend to have certain types of personalities, but the ENT surgeons, urologists, they tend to be quite a different breed compared to the orthopedics and the general surgeons. I mean, it's not absolute, but there is you know, quite a bit, of, a bit of truth in this. I mean, when, when I was at more than um, one of the guys a year below me who was in the blues boat, um, six foot eight, massive guy who has become an orthopedic surgeon. Had failed all his exams, he's a busy rowing, perfect clever guy, but you know, um, and turn it around and he's just a typical orthopod basically. So <clears throat> obviously you don't have to revert to stereotypes, but I think this does make a serious point that within the specialities, there's quite different types of job with different demands on them. And so I don't do any on call at all, for example, and that's mainly because I'm an academic, but in radiology, the on-call is quite onerous as a trainee, but then as a consultant at the Christie, we have a very, very light on-call. Um, so it's quite nice, but there'll be consultants at the Christie who are in intensive care who will be in a lot. And if you're, for example, at Central Manchester, you're in intensive care, you will do a lot of acute out of hours work. So you know, that might be exciting when you're 30, but do you want to be doing that at 60? You know, so there are things like this to think about. Um, <clears throat> so. There are all these different types of careers, and as I say, I think this is from the GMC, you'll see that um, it's approximately 50-50 GP specialists, it's not, and there, there are things outside of that, like working in public health, um, and then within the different um, specialities, um, medicine and surgery still makes up about half or so, and things like radiology, which I do, is, is just a small percentage of pathology, a small percentage, etc. cetera. Um, so I think when you're going through medical school, Whilst you, you do want to be looking at the different um, attachments and obviously learning about the conditions, clearly, uh, but it is also worth, I think, particularly as you start to get a bit more senior, to very much look at the, the people who are doing these jobs. And obviously, you know, there won't be one ophthalmologist, there'll be several. But, um, you know, do you, do you like those sorts of people? Do you think, oh, yeah, I can see maybe that's my sort of personality type? Um, because I think um, Tashi made a really good point about applying to medical school, but probably top of her list would be where is the medical school? And I agree with that. I think too many people don't do that and don't understand the difference between you know, you know, different types of campus universities. Um, so I, I was in Nottingham uh, last week for something, and that is very much a sort of uh, walled off campus where you could easily spend the week just staying on campus, seeing friends, going to lectures. If you 
you know, Manchester, you are walking through Manchester to get from where you live to. So, so there's still some county universities that are really quite different. Um, and I think that's really, really important to understand that. And I think in picking a career, it's important to understand about things like lifestyle, or personalities, the way that jobs are structured work. So yes, it is important if you think, you know, you're fascinated by the kidney, you might want to be a nephrologist. But for example, a lot of nephrologists are quite an academic discipline. A lot of people in nephrologists and cardiologists have PhDs. Um, whereas in radiology, virtually no one does. Um, although in London, more people do. So, you know, you might decide, look, I really like renal stuff. I'm not fussed about academia, radiology, Short of speciality, um, you could be a you know, renal specialist radiologist still work in that area, but you have a different sort of you know, lifestyle. I mean, to you know, bear it in to go and assess, you know, to go and help some person who's in renal failure, you can sit at home and look at some scans if someone's in renal failure. So you might still be on call, but it's a different type of lifestyle. So I do think, as certainly as the people who, when you're in medical school, as you're going through, I do think these things are quite important to. To think about and and not just make a bit of a snap decision based on the very obvious in front of you things like do I like renal or cardiology or orthopedics etc. But about your lifestyle. <coughs> um, so I mean, in, so radiology, um, you know, in, in the old days, you know, it was, it was X-rays and ultrasounds, and um, so you know, these are just examples of some some common. Um, things which will probably mean something to the people who are in medical school, to people in sixth form, uh, might not mean anything. But um, in this example here, um, this is this is all that normal up here. This is this is um, this is basically like infection in the the upper lobe of the right lung. Uh, and this white that goes down here is actually effusion. So this is fluid. So this is fluid sitting um, outside of the lung. In the plural space, so um, you've got the chest wall and you've got the lungs, and there's a space, a plural space between. So, fluid sitting there and sort of shove the lung inwards. Whereas in the first example, um, that's gunk sitting in the lung parenchyma and the alveoli. So, these are different things which can potentially look a bit similar. <clears throat> and then this is like a classical example there's, there's, a, there's an extra line there, that, that line shouldn't be there, that's because uh, posteriorly the left lower leg has completely collapsed down, as probably due to. Lung cancer because collapse is normally due to lung cancer. So, so in radiology, um, you know, traditionally people are looking at pictures, and I, I always think it's a bit like um, I don't know if you, people have come across Where's Wally, the children's book. Do people know what I mean by that? That's where you're trying to. There's lots of um, uh, sort of crowd scenes that this artist has drawn, and, and he's hid a character which you're trying to find. Within that. And a lot of radiology is trying to find that abnormal bit within a picture um, or spot the difference uh, when you get two pictures that are basically the same as the differences. And uh, if say, for example, can to follow because that's what's useful, like right? what's it like now? Is it different? So it's quite visual. It's using some very complex machines of our physics and maths to produce pictures, and, but it's quite a qualitative art approach almost to, to medicine. Um, and um, to show, for example, yeah, um, this this is more high high end tech here. But this this is an example of a bone scan. Um, so this is where we inject a tracer, which which uh, that, that's this person's cafeterized. That's a, a cafeter bag on the leg. Okay, so it gets peed out. So that's why that's hot. Uh, but you can see there are some abnormal areas here. Okay, that that area is abnormal, and on the X-ray, it looks fine, but on the MRI scan, this this is part of the bone here. So this is what the bone should look like. That's the um, femoral head, and that's the acetabulum. And this bit here is the same signal as muscle, and that's because that's tumor. So that 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 is the same as that. So on the MRI, we're able to this is an MRI scan here. We're able to identify that. So, so this is also sort of pattern recognition and spotting, and, and I know, you know which you know, which bit of someone you know, that is and that is, etc. Most people here probably quite not, but because we over time get used to the anatomy and we, we know what it looks like and we know what common conditions look like. So in radiology, um, day in, day out across the country, people are assessing images like this. And you can see here this requires years of experience. Um, it requires some understanding of anatomy, a bit of understanding of, of physics of how, how the images are made with different modalities. <laughs> and experience is really the key thing. If you've been doing this for 20, 30 years, you've seen it before, 
you know what the answer is. You know, and, it's, and it's hard when you're um, learning um, to get there, and you, there's nothing as a substitute for putting the hours in. Okay, that's what you have to do. Um, and you can see here, if, for example, you've done orthopedics, interpreting some of the bones, maybe it's quite useful. So in my day, I did six months orthopedics, six months general, six months urology, six months neuro, um, AME, etc. So you can see all these different jobs actually do sort of help you um, over the years. Um, and so if you're a cancer specialist at the Christie, this is the sort of stuff you look at, but it's very visual. Now, it's very different from what I spend most of my time doing, uh, which is quantitative imaging. Okay, so in quantitative imaging, um, so this is an example here, this is an MR, and um, we've, I've just sliced it in half. So that's actually the liver, okay? Um, so this is, the, the liver basically is like here, and we'll be going across there. And in the liver is a big metastasis, okay? So that's, that's, um, that's, that's, that's spread, this, this, is, this is sort of a bowel cancer, so this is a bowel cancer, it's metastasized to the liver. Okay, so the way the liver metastasis is there. And in the sorts of things I do, we do functional imaging, um, where, sorry, it's, it's very sluggish, so it's not responding very well. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so we do, we do functional imaging a lot. So hope you can see that's the same shape as the thing that's outlined in red. Um, and this is a map of basically, if you consider this as blood flow, it's not, that's not quite true, but if you think of this as blood flow, um, we've scanned the patient and we've done this in a complex way where we've injected some tracer, we then scan very, very fast and we keep measuring every few seconds what happens to the MR scan as the tracer goes through the, the body and it goes through the tumour. <coughs> and we're able to, um, by measuring every few seconds and look at how it changes, we're able to understand something about the blood flow. Okay, because effectively the tracers going in the vessels through the tumour. Okay? So we're able to measure aspects of the tumour. And you can see there, so if I tell you that yellow and white is more, and blue is less, and red and orange in the middle, you can see there that there's two bits of the tumour that don't have as much blood flow compared to the other bits. Okay? And then if we, um, and, and that's scanned twice um, before treatment, if we then um, treat the patient um, over the course of um, a cycle of therapy, um, you can see that the tumour actually does get a bit smaller, but by 12 days, it's, whilst it's got a bit smaller, it's become an awful lot less hot. Okay? So the blood flow has substantially reduced there, and that's in one tumour. And if we were to look at multiple tumours in, say, um, different patients, we can start to quantify that. So I can, you can imagine here, I somehow can crunch the numbers that go into making the maps for treatment, and then I can get the numbers and the subsequent maps. So you can, I mean, if you just imagine, for example, that every pixel that's white is 10, if it's white, 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 yellow, it's nine, etc. cetera, and you have a scale, you will get a summary number across that tumour. And we can track in time how it's changed. So we're able to basically look at how the blood flow is changing in time. And what you can see there is that it's going down in all of them, but you can see in the curve over here, the blood flow is going back up and maybe even overshooting. And in these ones, it's going back to where it was at the beginning, whereas in these, it's staying down. So you're starting to say here, we can measure things like blood flow or metabolism or hypoxia or various different aspects in tumours. And we can use imaging to start to understand how tumours are behaving differently. And one big thing in medicine at the moment is something called personalised medicine or stratified medicine, where we try to move away from the notion that everybody with a certain type of cancer, for example, so if you think everybody with, say, stage four ovarian cancer would get a certain type of treatment, can we start to say, well, actually, can we do different genetic tests? Can we do uh, imaging tests? Start to stratify people and say that although people might all fit into a category that they've got the same type of cancer, the same extent of spread, that there's still differences there and we need to treat people differently. Because if, for example, we have therapies that alter blood flow, um, you imagine that um, if some of the tumours, and so this, this therapy alters blood flow, you see in some of these tumours you have an effect it's maintained still, in others you have an effect and it's lost. So you might want to dose those people differently on subsequent 
um, cycles, for example. <clears throat> so this is a lot of the sort of imaging I do. And so, it, you know, that, that's using MR. That picture I showed where there was a metastasis in uh, next to the hip, in the acetabulum, that's using MR. So we're actually using exactly the same machine, but we're doing something very, very different. So in clinical practice at the moment, we mainly, radiology, make pictures and look at patterns. And in imaging science, we very much use the same sorts of machines to create numbers and to stratify people and to measure effect. You can imagine if you get numbers, you can do statistics on it. So you can look at cohorts and start proving evidence of therapies working better or worse. Whereas if you're just looking at pictures, that's quite hard to do. <clears throat> so as an academic, I do two jobs. Um, I do the clinical practice and I do the science, and they're really quite dif different. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to really labour on this at all, other than to say, when I was training, a lot of this more structured approach to academic clinical training started to come in, um, and I caught the sort of the tail end of it. But I think just to be aware that if people are interested in doing ac academia, there are now some much more defined routes to doing that. Because in the past, it was slightly you had to just go out and find it yourself. So there are now some much more established pathways in certain times, for example, when people are expected to do a PhD, uh, if, if indeed they, they, they want to do one. Uh, the majority, so the majority of medics won't do a PhD. I don't want people to especially people at school to sort of go away confused thinking that everybody who does a medical degree also does a PhD. But for people who actually want to become academics, uh, there are some much more structured pathways now about when you do a PhD and how, and there are things like an MD, PhD program in different universities. Um, one thing I think I would say though is that in some universities, it's compulsory to do an interplanetary degree, um, and in other universities it isn't. Um, so I think if you're interested in and you're still at um, school or college and you actually think academia is for you um, I would add to what Natasha was saying I would say that you know you, you should be putting down places probably that have an integrated um, well, well you, you'll be able to choose anywhere so maybe it doesn't matter totally but you'll probably find you'll have a higher caliber of academic students if you go to the places that uh, it's compulsory but you know here at Manchester Plenty of people will do integrated um, BSCs, basically. Um, right. Um, so I'm just going to um, do a few slides now where I'll partially go through some of the things I do in science, but I said I'm just going to whiz through these. And I, I want people to sort of take away the ideas behind them and not get sort of, you know, bogged down in any details at all. <clears throat> um, so I sort of diverged from being like a more like a standard doctor at about 2005 when I did my PhD. So um, I, I had to go down to London, go for a competitive interview, um, get grilled. So I mean, I was what, about 30 then? And you're going down, you're getting grilled by about 10, 15 professors. So, so it was a good old traditional, you're at one end of the table, they're all sitting down at the other end of the table, all like staring at you. And it's, you know, asking you all kinds of silly questions about things and trying to, trying to be difficult, you know. And, that they were not easy to get, but I, I got one of I got one of the grants, and so then I, I had several papers. And, and if you are just at Lima, that's that's the key bottleneck, really. If you get onto one of these quality sought after PhD programs, because it lets you do the research, but it also badges you. And in academia, you want to get badged as someone who's like in the A team, because if you get a grant like that from CRUK or MRC or whatever. Um, you stand out because most people don't get it. Um, so that is important. And it's really important also to just go with the right, the people you think are the right people. So they were really my three supervisors. So Alan, who um, at the top is radiology, who was professor of radiology here uh, for me, he, he retired a few years ago. Uh, Gordon, Jason Dart, Boston, who's just about to retire, is a uh, professor of uh, medical oncology, so he does okay. Co-rector at uh, Christie, who's a great man, uh, and Jeff Parker, who's now uh, who still lives in Manchester, but is now at ECL in London. Um, 
who uh, so, so radiologists, physicists, oncologists. So that was a great team, uh, all very good people. And that and and you go from starting that where you know you've got academic aspirations, but you haven't really ever delivered anything to coming out of that with stuff that would be seen as internationally recognised work. Um, and you know, I, and this was a great thing I, I wrote, which is kind of my like PhD literature review, but this, this was a little mini review which was pertinent, it was on the message and it just did really well and got um, sight and loss and that sort of started to get me known. So the PhD sort of went well. Um, I did all, we did all kinds of things. So this is, these are mouse tumors. This is, I mean, this is again, this is anti vascular drug. You can basically see that uh, the tumors look like that before you drink, but then you, you sort of whack a hole out of them. And, and as the dose goes, as the time goes on, you get more of a hole. So we're doing experiments basically to look at how these, these drugs that attack vascular work. And so in the, in the mid 2000s, then this was all quite exciting. Uh, these drugs are starting to get, get into the, um, the clinic so that they were like the grew to immunotherapies now. This was so everybody's like. You know, obsessed about immunotherapies. In 15, 20 years ago, everybody was obsessed about uh, VEGF inhibitors, so vascular endothelial uh, growth factor receptor inhibitors. And they, they haven't died, they're still in practice, but they didn't end up doing anywhere near as much as, as people hoped they, they would do. And immuno you know, will be the same, it won't be as, it won't be as successful. Um, it, it's good for some patients, and that's what that, that's the stage with immunotherapies as well. They're, they're all beneficial for some people, but not for everybody. Um, so I, I did sort of these sort of you know, mouse experiments, things like this, with drugs companies, <coughs> um, and then post PhD sort of got into some data science type things. And um, the point of here, you know, you, if you're going to do academic research at a high level, you need to be new. You know, you, you've got some quite complex maths. But what was interesting, you know, I was very good at um, maths at school. In fact, I was going to do maths at university. And um, true story, my um, teacher who was helping with the UCAS forms just crossed out maths and put medicine down. And that's why I didn't do medicine, actually. It was literally a teacher that my form um, on the, like, the practice thing. And then I had to like, do my proper one and, and put medicine down. Um, but I was very good at maths. I realised then working in sort of in postgraduate science, I'm not anywhere near as good at maths. And most people actually who work for me nowadays are maths or physics or computer science people. And they are properly good at maths. Um, and so one of the things you start to realise, you have to start to collaborate with people who do these other subjects. Um, and if you are going to be um, interested in academia, um, you often end up as a medic becoming a group leader. Um, so one of the skills is to start to, to work out how to hire people who are good at some of these um, different disciplines, but how to be able to manage and get the best out of them. So here we're basically applying um, so called fractal mathematics to uh, tumours. So that, that coloured blob is a funny shaped tumour and we're basically looking at the space, how it fills space. So we, we, we're basically looking at the spatial complexity and the idea is that the more spatially complex tumour is a bad one. So if it's a nice round spherical blob, it, it, they tend to not be as bad as if they're nasty spiky jacking point of things. They tend to be worse and the fractal mass lets you put a number on the, the sort of jaggediness of it. There are metrics like how jackety it is that come out of, of it uh, with complex names. <coughs> so, so we started to show that this potentially had some, some value. Um, but so, you know, pre-clinical uh, mouse stuff, then doing sort of maths and physics stuff. Um, I think it's important to say also that you will, if you, if anyone does go down an academic career, but I think also just when you, if you also um, abstract this to the notion of doing postgraduate exams, you, you will unfortunately fail things. At medical school, you should generally pass exams. Um, so I, I, so no, I think that's still true. So the expectation is if you work for it, you should pass it. Um, when you get to postgraduate level, if you're talking about the postgraduate exam, so to become a radiologist or a surgeon or you know, GP or whatever, and a lot of them have very high fail rates. Um, and so you have to then get into the mindset that you may fail exams, which a lot of people aren't that used to, because they've probably been the best at school and then you know, in conscientious medical school. Um, and that is a, it's a bit of an old system. So I mean, I, I remember when, when I was doing my surgical exams, a trick that the examiners used to love was take to a patient who'd got, say, for example, um, bilaterally enlarged kidneys, get, get you to examine the patient, and then 
take away, and then real personal causes of hepatitis melanoma, and then um, ask the person, oh, what do you find in our patients? And of course, the trick is to say, oh, of course, this patient had you know, large and large kidneys. But we uh, did enjoy talking about hepatitis melanoma. You know? And whereas, if, 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 now you wouldn't get a, a medical school finals that wouldn't do that, but they just like to do things like that just to try and make it fail. Um, and and why they do that, I don't know. Um, but in academia, you get sort of lots of things like this as well. So it's very hard to get grants. So you're putting something that's really good, doesn't get funded, and it's quite demoralising. And you and, and even just on the basic study level, where you do a study, it's a good study, you submit it, you get rejected. For no particular reason, I had a study on Monday, it's a good study, the, the, the readers don't understand it, just gets rejected, it's really annoying. Even when they are going to accept a study, the, the letter comes back saying, unfortunately, it's completely unacceptable and it's good, but it makes it sound like it's horrendous. But that's actually a good letter, that means they love it. Um, and, uh, and so you do have to, I think, in all forms of medicine, get used to dealing with some degree of rejection, um, which is a bit, uh, and you get it a bit later after you've basically been very successful for, for years. So it's, it's a bit of an odd thing. But in academia, it's a, a terrible. And I, I had a, a particular moment when I, I, I had the worst interview of my life, and it was like the screen there. Uh, it was just awful. And I remember coming out thinking it was okay. And then by the time I got to use of thinking it wasn't great. And then by the time I got home, just thinking, oh, I was just awful, wasn't it? I'm never going to get funded again. And it actually was a springboard to probably my biggest achievement in, in academia. But um, you've got to learn to, to cope with that. And there's a small line often between that screen to sort of some sort of heavenly, you know, uh, wonderful thing that everybody loves it. Um, often the little margins, but. You have to you have to get used to that, I think, in, in academic medicine, certainly, but I think also probably generally in medicine, if that's the case. <coughs> um, so I, I had um, one of my studies, which was um, it was a good study. It wasn't a major cancer breakthrough, in my opinion, but the Express thought it was. And so I got this rare. This is before the Donald became president. So I got this rare, this nice little um, um, front page on the Express where it's. Uh, Donald, uh, Kate Nelson, and, and actually myself. It's quite, it's quite hard to see to me. If it's, you know, uh, um, um, so this, this, this is a good example where you, some things get into the press which shouldn't do. Um, it, it was this was an okay study, but anyway, it, it made um, front cover of Cancer Research, which is a good um, journal. But it's um, it also has got on the Express. That's quite I think probably the only person ever got something on the front cover of the Express and Cancer Research in the same day. I imagine. Um, so, um, in academia, it's really important um, for teamwork, and um, it's also that's also true, of course, in any sort of practice. But I think, particularly in academia, it's really important. So, you know, not all this is a little bit old. As many people have, have moved on, but I have a lot of I have had and still have a lot of computer science type people. Um, so I uh, think like computer science, maths, uh, physics, 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 maths, physics, and then um, I have these two uh, in vivo went like biologists, um, medics who do PhDs, uh, barbers, a maths technician, um, and a science communication person. So quite a sort of uh, that's my man uh, management team. I've got people in London, um, and so you've got some quite diverse people, and. Um, you know, and so, for example, sometimes we do science communication type things at schools, um, and so I command and arrange those, and then some of the team would come along and do that. Um, and all these people are individually specialists. What's quite interesting is, so Ahmed, um, who's back in Jordan now, is uh, extremely good, and Michael, who is a scientist at the Christie, uh, who has a lot of PhD, so he's doing it part-time, um, and he's a as well. It's interesting to the people so, so he's not a he's not a doctor, but he's an NHS scientist. It's interesting that some people are leaders. The majority of people you work with in sort of the science disciplines aren't and don't want to be. So they're very good at doing their job. But um, so I would say one thing as a doctor is you will almost certainly have some sort of leadership role or have leadership qualities coming out in your career, whatever that is. Certainly what I do. Uh, I, I had to run a small business, right, to get money in, and these people work for me, and if I don't bring the money in, they don't 
get paid you know, at these jobs. So I have to do things like that. So it's very clear that you are sort of in charge and, and, and leading it. Um, but um, I think even if you are, for example, you know, in a, in a surgical part of the hospital, you end up having to run aspects of it if you're the doctor. So it sort of goes without saying if you're medical, you know, and obviously GP practice, you, you'll often co run the practice, people tend to sort of get to the top and leave things. There is maybe a little bit of sea change in some of that nowadays with, with medicine. So in my day, there was a very clear career structure. If you got off that career structure, you singled yourself out as being a bit sort of deficient to some extent. I think nowadays it's not quite the same that everybody just goes and becomes first year qualified and then just keep on going and going and going. There's a bit more of a different attitude now. And I think sometimes people are more like a jobbing doctor for a while. Um, but I think at the end, if you want to get sort of a bit more fixed on what you do as, as a career, you have to end up leaving. Um, so I think teamwork, leadership, you know, um, Tash mentioned it in the applying for medical school, I'm sure it'll be mentioned in the interviews bit for the people who are sort of college. Um, there are reasons why these things are, are looked at and are important. Okay. Um, so then I've you know, got more papers that sort of did okay. Um, and this is what you have to do as, a, as an academic, you have to publish papers, you just keep getting papers out. Um, and, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, I'm not going to label this, but basically, you know, we, we look at measuring oxygen levels and tumor cells, as well as measuring blood flow, which is what I started doing, which is uh, this um, sort of parameter here. We're looking at, um, uh, so, so this one here, we're looking at oxygen levels, and we started to realize that there was a disconnect sometimes in this area here, for example, with oxygen and, and blood flow, although you know, that tumor looks sort of pretty much the same. Um, and we started to hypothesize that we could use MRI to. Um, measure oxygen levels in patients, and this is this is something people have been trying to do radio therapy for a long time because we think that tumors that have low oxygen do very badly. Um, so that's sort of my main area of interest. And so we when we started this. I mean, that's published in two thousand and nine. Uh, we were doing that for several years before we got it published. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in the last sort of fifteen years um, doing this. So yeah, mouse experiments, um, same pathology and imaging, seeing how they correlate. Um, Initial experiment doing on multiple cohorts looking at um, uh, plotting relationship between a, an MR thing and a pathology thing, um, and working out what's the best way to crunch that data, and then starting to apply this in patients and doing various different steps and looking at, say, the data repeatability. So sometimes we do tests that, that you know, we do it one day, do it another day, and get totally different answers. So you have to start doing kinds of steps where you do research to look at the quality of the, the data you're churning out. So various studies like that, and starting to get a sense of whether or not our measurements uh, change in patients, which, which they do. Um, and so we can then start to take that forward into subsequent studies and work out, um, can we use this to plan uh, which patients are hypoxic and maybe need to change in their therapy before we give them radiotherapy, and which patients aren't hypoxic, and maybe more interestingly, which patients rapidly stop being hypoxic in their tumours uh, when we get therapy. <clears throat> so we've started to get this now in the Christian signal called MR Linux. So this is a machine that's um, both a radiotherapy deliverer, so it's called a Linux, a linear accelerator, and um, an MRI scanner. And so with these are the sort of pictures we get. So looking at the um, levels of hypoxia um, in uh, tumours. Um, so that's, that's good, that's bad on the scale. And so we can start to, to map this quite clearly in patients. Um, so, you know, that's taken 15 years to get to there because um, lots of tech involved, it's very difficult. We're now sort of flying, I suppose. So in fact, yesterday we had um, this, was, uh, we had an article in, um, in the Eye, which is a, you know, a newspaper in the UK, and also in uh, Physics World sort of uh, promoting some of that um, work, uh, which is nice to see. Um, getting a bit of traction. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, in a research career, it does take a very, very long time. It takes an awful lot of people to, 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 to help you, you know, a bit of a sense of a timeline uh, there uh, of how long this can take. Uh, I run a national network which tries to get this across multiple centers. Uh, again, there are lots of people in different institutions you have to work with. <coughs> um, I'm just going to skip that slide. Um, so, um, I think 
and then and then even if we get this to work well, we don't have to get it into healthcare systems. So we have to somehow integrate the research that we're doing and get it into um, existing healthcare uh, systems. So, for example, get it um, compatible with uh, the scanner manufacturer, get it to fax, get the data we do integrated with different um, diagnostics, work out how we can run um, the stats and the appropriate outcomes in real time rather than taking it offline and getting someone to it on their laptop, for example. Um, so I think I'm going to um, pretty much finish um, there, actually. Um, the last, last main part I was going to say, actually, though, which I think ties back to something that Natasha was saying also, and the first thing I ever got published was um, called Earnest. It was in the BMJ, and I don't know if they still do this, but it's quite a good thing if you are interested in academia. Some journals take what they call fillers, and it's where you can write a little piece of something and it's literally because they've got a bit of space on the page and um, I saw this patient on a Friday uh, who was this, who came to clinic and looked terrible and he died I think on Monday and you know so we're missing him from clinic and he looked awful and he had um, stomach cancer and it was interesting talking to him because his so he knew he was going to die he came, he came to clinic and he was going to die which is quite unusual I don't know if I had that before someone actually basically comes and says, I'm ill, I'm, I'm dying, doctor. Um, and he said that. And his fear, he didn't want to have post-mortem. So he, what I managed to find out from him was the only thing he was really bothered about was not having a post-mortem. Um, and when I said, well, look, I'll be the one signing your death certificate, and I don't think, we've got to diagnose today, I don't think we need to have a post-mortem. He was relieved and he basically died. Um, and I made this, and I wrote a thing about that, and I, I suppose um, I make that, that point at the end because um, as a clinician scientist, as an academic, you are both, and this was on, this was the last one on Sarah Peter's website about this job I do, um, you, you are both the scientist and the doctor. So although you might focus on the science aspect, and that makes you unusual compared to most doctors, you still need to go back to being a doctor. I mean, that sort of understanding of the compassion, the kindness, which I think they were made the point for the interviews. They want to see people who are clever, but also got those other skills. And I think that's very, very true. And even as an academic medic, what stands you out from being an academic medic rather than just an academic is the fact you've still got that link to the practice. Okay, and so I think it's important to sort of finish on that point to, to, to make that um, clear. So I'll probably stop there. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions. I'm conscious people might want food, so I'm going to stay around for a little bit over food for people want to ask any questions over there, but I don't know if we want any time for any questions now or does anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, I'll run over with the mic. Is it not going on? Yeah, if you can shout out. What are your opinions on so the question was what what do you think of AI? Uh, is it a threat to maybe generally medicine, but particularly like, uh, radiology? Uh, I don't think uh, so. I do do some AI type research. Uh, no, I mean I think it it will replace some things we do, which is good, uh, but um, it won't. Uh, there, there are people who say like radiologists won't exist because it's all just pass recognition, but that that, that won't happen. Um, so there are some things, for example, which are very subtle recurrences, which an algorithm is going to miss. Or if if it's conceived such that it picks that up, people should pick up everything. So you're either going to get false negatives or false positives. So, um, but it's useful on certain areas. So in fact, so I mean, what one area that we use it in, for example, just as a tool, is when when rather than just delineate uh, all our mouse models, rather than just draw random or manually, we can now run a program which will actually recognize where the boundary between the tube and not tube should be. We can then check that and amend them. So we use it as a tool, it doesn't replace it. But I think there's an, an analogous point there. Say, if you look at, say, you break the wrist, um, it's still really, really useful to get a plate film. Of the wrist, and that will let us generally speaking see has the broken wrist, yes or no, and if so, what type of break is it? Sometimes you might then need to do a CT to plan the surgery, 
And you might get some patients where you just can't find anything you think, and it must have broken so it might be an MR that shows what we call bone bruise, so it's basically a very subtle fracture that just hasn't broken before set, so you just can't see it on the on the radiograph. But my point is you've got other tests that have come along, but they haven't displaced some of those really useful ones. And then there are, and then look at another example for pulmonary embolus. We used to do something called a VQ nuclear medicine scan, which was a silly type test. Now we do um, CT examinations, and that has wiped us out. So I think there are examples where advances in technology totally get rid of things, but they probably wouldn't be greatest in the first place. And where something's really good and has value, you, you might modify the way it's done, but I still think it's, it, it, it will stand. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, yes. Oh. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering regarding the kind of ethical issues, kind of maybe, are there any decisions, like kind of hard decisions you've had to make, any kind of moral dilemmas that you've encountered as a doctor? And what was your thought process to try and work through them? <coughs> well, as a, just as a doctor or as an academic? Well, as an academic, just uh, go over it. Well, as an academic, you, so if you're a doctor, you're basically dealing with patients and colleagues, aren't you? And I suppose like mates, but who the cat is as colleagues. Um, as an academic, you're dealing with, sometimes with patients. So, like in research study, you, you, I, might, I mean, in the old days, I would have recruited the patients to see myself, I didn't do any of that anymore, but um, so I people do that for me. But, um, you don't see much of patients, so you've basically got colleagues you're dealing with um, who maybe say work for you. So I suppose in the the first example, um, I mean I'm probably the worst person to ask that to because I'm an academic and I'm a radiologist who only does cancer and generally works at home uh, reporting it. So I, I, I haven't seen a patient for for us a decade. Um, but um, yeah, I mean ethical issues, I suppose. Um, Probably the one that comes up most for me is probably dealing with colleagues. I think people are not, not at the medical student interview particularly. Oh no, you might get this. You might you might get this as a as a sorry MMI. It's dealing with a difficult colleague. And I think that's hard because you do get difficult colleagues. And when we appoint consultant posts, the key thing with the key thing is not this is the best radiologist in the world. But they need to be good, but is this someone you want to work with for the rest of your time? Uh, and because you can you can not appoint someone, it's very hard to get rid of people when they're in post. And I, so I think dealing with difficult colleagues, we've had a few of those. And I think what you normally have to do there is you know, if, if someone's just a complete pain and there's a reasonable thing, you have to basically you know, um, share that with other people, escalate to line manage all that sort of stuff. So there's some quite so there's a boring answer, but it's based on quite set ways in which you, you deal with it. But I, I think for me, the sort of ethical and managerial things, it's more about the colleagues that probably things come up rather than patients uh, for me, but I, I'm at one end of medicine, so. Thank you, that was question. Any, this will be our last question if anyone's got one. No, okay, so basically now um, we're gonna go for lunch um, and that's downstairs, same room, and then we'll come back and sit around and talk. But before